Well, hello there, this is Shane from Shane's Books and Review, and I hope you are having a great day today. What is it that we're going to be talking about today? Well, Lynette had brought up that there was a new Pinder, well, kind of Pendergast, if it's in the Pendergast books, it's called Old Moans. And that is what we're going to be discussing today. And here is her comment. Of course, Old Bones was wrote by Lincoln Child. Lincoln Child? No. Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child. Although it's not a Pendergast book, it certainly fits into characters that have been in the Pendergast books. A friend of mine that I also told that, hey, look, this is what we're going to be going over. They're like, man, I really like the introduction of this new character, Corey. And I'm like, he <laughs> <laughs> You haven't been reading the books, have you? Uh, because Corio was introduced way back, I think in like the second trilogy, and how he couldn't remember the very young gothic cult hit Princess Corey Swanson. <laughs> it gave me a good chuckle. I figured I'd share it with you guys and gals. It was enjoyable because Corey was a character that was in a few appearances from that point forward, and that's been awesome. Especially how we've kind of been surrogates. We've been able to watch her go from the unsure that just really needed an out. She got the out. She's making the best of the situation. She goes to college and you know, it's just, it's a really good storytelling. We've had all these little snippets through and now we get to see the accumulation of that. This book, if you're into Pendergast novels heavily and you've read them all, you're probably going to like it for a few particular reasons. One, in my opinion and some of your opinions, the last few books have been just a little lackluster. This was a, a resurgence, I would say. There, it's a new chapter for the Pendergast novels. We've got this character that's an established character like Vincent was. She's not been so directly related to the cases that Pendergast has been doing that she's not been A, tainted by the world, or B, overly played. And that's kind of an important thing. Now also, Lynette brought up that Nora is in this, and if anybody remembers Nora Kelly, she was in the first book. She was married to Bill Smith back, and if you look back across the books, it, it was really kind of unique to see what happened there, because in Thunderbolt, I think that she was like a fictionalized character, but then it comes to find out she's actually a real character, and then she moves to New York, gets married to Bill Smith back, which was a reporter. And Bill Smithback was a very pivotal character in the early books. And I really liked the whole, in the first first few series, how he played into things. It was really like a Nure type of a situation. Not only is he a reporter, but he's the type of reporter that has a heck of a lot of integrity. And he's not afraid to put things on the line. And unfortunately, that became his undoing in the end because he was such a public figure. With all that said, and Diogenes kind of a forethought but a background image, would this book stand up on its own if you had never read any of the other Pendergast novels? It most certainly would. And for that, congratulations. I was really starting to worry about the future of Pendergast, and I still kind of am, but I think that they made a very apt choice to set back and to just kind of focus on a few of the projects that they want to do so they can rekindle the love for writing. Even if the last Pendergast novel was the last Pendergast novel, and he only made short appearances from time to time, if they expounded on the universe like they just did with different books and different series, I think I would be happy with that decision. How about you guys and gals out there? What would be your input on that situation? That's the question of the week. It's kind of known that I don't really hold words whenever it comes to narrations of books. Cynthia Farrell. I don't want to get to the point where there's a stigma where people think that I don't like women narrators because that's not it at all. Cynthia did a wonderful job with this book in between not being supercilious, not being too far outside of the scope and range of what her voice can do in a believable fashion. She actually nailed the book really well. I think she got the intent. I think that she got a lot of the characters, the way that they would be feeling nailed down correctly. There were subtle hesitations here and there and different rhythmic things that were put into voices at different times. And it all came together in the production of the audiobook to make it a very enjoyable read. And in fact, I'm not going to say who it was at the end of the book, but you'll know who I'm talking about if you've read it or listened to it. That was even uniquely done and I really appreciated the take that was on it because it was her own version of it and I think it was true to the way that she would be reading that character. I liked it. Would I want that to be the constant for that voice? No, because I'm so used to all the previous books. However, if this is the way that that character had been 
done throughout the entire series, it would have had a completely different overtone to me. So, yeah, that would have been acceptable and it would have been fine and it would have been cool. With all that to the side, what does this book make me feel? What is its intrinsic value to Shane? And maybe to you as well. It was a book kind of of hope for me. And here's why it was a book of hope. Corey is one of those things where she's a highly relatable character. I mean, there's no question about it. Everybody has known either a time period in their life or a friend's life where everything was just completely wrong and they never got that chance. They never got the ability to become what they wanted and needed to become. And for that, throughout this book, it was my hopes for her as a character that she would be wrote in such a way that she could come to that realization of who she is. And I think that with one of the end scenes, that that was actually realized for her. She's got a good heart still. She's not incredibly jaded by the world and the things around her. And she's got a really good analytical mind. Granted, it's young, it's going to make errors, and that's fine, that will make for good reading. So if Douglas and Preston happen to see this, you write as a team and you excel each other in such a glorious way that it makes it really entertaining for those of us that read. The point about this is, if you decided to make more books with her, I don't think that you would go wrong with it. Some of the more interesting comments this week that I found was from It's Archie. And It's Archie, I'll put the comment up here, says, I love the series. Definitely not high literature or particularly serious. The characters are charismatic, if cartoonish, enough to make me like them. And it's just good old fashioned, rollicking, pulpish action adventure that often makes me laugh at the sheer silliness of the situations they get themselves into. They go probably technically counts as Gary Stu, but with this ridiculous and slightly tongue in cheek series, that just seems to fit all the better. Great comment. And, and for those of you that are wondering what Gary Stu is, it's, yeah, it, it's kind of a funny thing because I, I like the tongue-in-cheek comment with the tongue-in-cheek in the comment. <laughs> well played, sir. Uh, but anyway, the long of it all is Gary Stu or Barry Stu is a character that always comes out on top, always wins, is practically flawless in every way. I kind of think that you're right. McGill is certainly Gary Stu, and if it was me that was writing it, I would certainly make his stigma sex. Not that it would become a romantic novel at all. But instead, I would make it where it becomes almost like a stigma for the god. Perfect in every way, always wins, always gets this, always gets this, but can never, and I think that might be what's happening, so good point. A comment on a book that we had covered last year, a little bit before now, in the year, but it was Broken Angels, which was wrote by Richard K. Morgan, and there was a prequel to that, which was Altered Carbon, which was turned into a Netflix series. The comment that Tom made was, needle casting doesn't take more than a few minutes objective time. And yes, that's accurate. I'm not exactly sure where that fits into that video, because I didn't ask a question in that video. And I did go back and I watched the 24 minute Bohemoth, <laughs> but I think that we're on the same page, Tom. I think that there was a lot of things in that series that really could have been expounded on. And I had read it a long time before I had done that review and then I was going through them again. And it had been so long that it was almost like going through another set of brand new books, but there was a thing that I made in this video, a comment that I made in this video where I said, I thought that I'd stopped reading it because I didn't want that universe to end. And for me and my personality type, a lot of the times that could be a true statement, but it wasn't. Is that that last book was just, ah, hmm, for me. That doesn't mean that's going to be like that for everybody. But no, I agree with you. Needle casting does only take a few moments of time. And that's one of the reasons why I think that the author was so adamant about the differences between subjective and objective time. Being that a person's individual experiences can last only 20 or 30, 100 years. But if they're needle casting back and forth, and you're right, and that it only takes a matter of moments for them to get from point A to point B, subjectively, but objectively, over the course of time, it might take them 70 years to get from point A to point B. That could have been where that comment came from, because I didn't really get into all that in this video, and maybe I should have. And then again, it was 24 minutes, and it was a long video, so if you made it through, Tom, thank you for that. Big, big kudos to you. And if I'm wrong, if I've missed the point, please clarify for me. 
and, and we'll have a conversation about it. So the books that I have coming up that we're going to be talking about is Chains of Command, if I haven't already done it. The Listener, which I know I'm, I've mentioned, but I'm having a hard time getting through that book, and it's not for the reasons that you would think. It actually seems to be a good book. It's just from a different perspective, and I'm having a hard time relating to the perspective, but I respect the subject and the subject matter inside of that, which that was wrote by Robert R. McCammon. And also, I've gone through <laughs> a metric ton more of the Super Melanie series that was wrote by C.T. Phipps. And then the books by Rick Brown. Yes, it's Rick. It's not Reich. I've been saying Reich forever, and then I finally got an audio book of it, and it's Rick. So Rick... I am very sorry that I mispronounced your name in what feels like 30 videos, but I did. There's another one which started me on the Marco Close books again, which was The Points of Impact from the Frontline series, book number six, which I'm looking forward to getting to that, and I should have already got it, but I wanted to go back and reread them. So I know that I had gotten Angels of Attack from him done. You see what I mean? There's just, there's so many books, so many. But that's okay, I love them. And those are the ones that are just on here. Then there's all the ones that I have on Kindle and the physical copies. And I haven't also, update, I haven't forgot about the House of Leaves. I have started that process and I figured out how exactly it won't work, which is good because now I've got a game plan. And it's, oh, it's gonna be massive. It's gonna be massive, but it, it will work this way, which is cool. Because I did a short test with just, I think it was six pages and it took me three weeks not because of being a bum but because of all the data that i had to create in order to make the correlate you'll see but that's still that's on that's on the burner it's it's going to happen but anyway so those are some of the books that i've got coming up specifically chains of command the listener secrets of super villainy the games of super villainy freedom's dawn the legend of the coronary coronar is it yeah it's coronar isn't it so i've got rise of the canal coronar Cornary, Legend of the Cornary, Points of Impact, and then Dry, The Dry by Jane Harper. That was a book that Lynette had also mentioned, and I'm about halfway through that one. Uh, it's a lot different from a lot of the things that we cover, and it's been one of those things I've been enjoying very much so. I mean, don't get me wrong, sci-fi gets my blood going, but sometimes there will be a book that's kind of different, and this one most certainly is. It's really good. The Everlong video that I thought I was going to shoot in six minutes, seven minutes, and here I am 40 minutes long with probably seven minutes of actual usable stuff anyway that doesn't matter what does matter is you guys and gals watched thank you if you made it to the end i appreciate it in such a big big way like share subscribe this is shane from shane's books and review i hope that you enjoy the video today and i will see you in the next video